Hey YouTube, welcome back to the channel. Today I want to do a uh, player profile. Um, and we all know how intimidating this guy is, Aaron Judd, right? When he gets up, when Judge gets up, uh, you know, he's 6'7", 270 pounds. He's just probably the most intimidating player in baseball today when he steps up to the plate. Well, the guy I want to tell you about, he was Aaron Judge, but he was Aaron Judge 60 years ago. That's how uh, big and intimidating he was. It's this guy right here, Frank Howard. He may have been the most intimidating player uh, to ever play baseball. He was uh, about 6'8", came into the league about 250 during the height of his playing career, uh, was normally between 270 and 290. So just a mountain of a man um, who in the late 60s and early 70s was one of the strongest sluggers uh, for the Senators. But he started his career out with the Dodgers um, in the early 60s. He um, he was a good all-around athlete in high school, or college, I'm sorry. He was both an All-American in basketball and baseball. As a matter of fact, his uh, junior year in basketball, he averaged 20.1 points a game, 15.3 rebounds. Uh, one tournament at Madison Square Garden, he set the uh, single uh, rebound record with 32 rebounds in one game. And over that uh, same three-game span, he had 75 rebounds. He was, uh, he was so good that he was drafted by the uh, Philadelphia Warriors. But, um, you know, baseball back then was where the more and more money was. And there were a number of baseball teams that were looking at him. Uh, the one that had the most interest was the Dodgers. And that's the one he was most interested in signing. And right before he uh, went to sign with the Dodgers, um, the Baltimore Orioles offered him a $120,000 signing bonus. And uh, he, um, he wanted to sh shine with the Dodgers, so he told the Dodgers that they would pay him $108,000, $100,000 for him, $8,000 so his parents could buy a new house that he'd sign with them. And um, he did, which... Um, you know, just to put that in perspective, $100,000 uh, back in the day was, uh, yeah, that would equate to close to $1.1 million today. So it was a pretty nice signing bonus, $100,000 back in 1958. Um, he went off to the minor leagues where he was the minor league player of the year, hitting well over 40 home runs. People were thinking he was going to be the next um, Babe Ruth. The problem that he ran into was the Dodgers had a pretty stacked outfield. You know, they still had these two guys on the bookends of this card. Carl Ferrello and Duke Snyder were still finishing up their careers. In addition to Ron Fairley, who was a pretty good young ball player, they had Tommy Davis, who won back-to-back -back batting titles for them in 61 and 62. And they had this guy, Willie Davis, who was a, a perennial uh good ball player and all-star. So um, it was a pretty tough way to break in. But in 1960, Carl Ferrello retired and they called up Frank Howard. And he was uh, he played in 117 games and he ended up hitting 23 homers, driving in 77 runs while hitting 268. And he ended up being the rookie of the year. The next year, um, you know, he had some injuries and it, they couldn't get him full-time playing. And uh, he hit 15 homers and 45 ribbies, but he hit 296. And he hit those 15 homers and 45 ribbies in 92 games or 292 at bats. So a lot of power still there. He just wasn't getting his playing time. In 62, the Dodgers lost their two first basemen to the expansion draft. So they moved Ron Fairley into... Um, into first base, and he got to play a lot more that year, and he broke out with his best year as a Dodger. In 123 games, he had 31 homers, 119 RBIs, and he hit 296 in a year that the Dodgers lost in a three-game playoff to the um, San Francisco Giants. And then for the remainder of his Dodger career, you know, he 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 couldn't get in full time. He was he was trying to get. Uh, some playing time, uh, and he had uh, many a debate with this gentleman, Walter Alston. Um, you know, he, he played uh, roughly, he was getting 400 at-bats a year, to be honest with you. Um, and, it, and then in 65, Walter Alston and Buzzy Babasi, you know, they felt that um, 
the way that Dodgers needed to go because Dodger Stadium was such a big park that um, they would have to go speed in defense. And they, they traded uh, Frank Howard along with a few other players. It was a seven-player uh, trade. They traded him to the Washington Senators. Uh, for the, you know, the two big players were Frank Howard and this guy, Claude Osteen. Well, what the Dodgers wanted to do was, in, you know, beef up their pitching and beef up their, um, and go with speed versus power. Um, and Frank wasn't the best fielder and he was pretty slow afoot. So the Dodgers at the time, you know, they would have had um, Sandy Koufax as their ace, followed by uh, Don Drysdale, who was, uh, you know, most could be an ace for most anyone else. They had Johnny Padres, who was coming off some injury seasons, and then they added uh, Claude Osteen. And, and it turned out to be a good trade for both teams right out of the gates. Um, the Dodgers went to the World Series in 65, and this was when they were playing the Minnesota Twins, and it, it was uh, the first game of that series was Yom Kippur, and um, so Koufax wouldn't pitch that day, so Drysdale did, and he lost. And then Koufax came back game two, and he lost. And they put the ball in this guy's hand for game three, and he stepped up to the plate, and uh, he won that game, um, and he got the Dodgers back in the series, and they eventually won that uh, in seven games with Koufax pitching on two days rest. But um, he, Osteen, you know, had an 064 ERA and a shutout in that series. And he was one of the reasons they won the title. He pitched for the Dodgers for nine years, you know, won 147 games, had a 309 ERA, two-time 20-game winner, three-time All-Star. So it, it worked out well for both teams. Um, but Big Frank right here, you know, he moved over to the, uh, Washington Senators, uh, and he was excited about the trade because, you know, what he said is, you know, I'm hitting 25 homers a year with 400 at-bats. I'd love to see what I could do with um, 550 at-bats. So, um, you know, he went to Washington. His first couple of years um, were okay. He hit 39 homers the first couple of years. And then um, one of his managers, he had two really managers that played key roles. One was this guy, Gil Hodges, the Hall of Famer. Um, who was his first manager at the time, he helped him to kind of revamp his swing, swing. He wanted him to get a little more uppercut in it. He thought it was a little too level. And uh, Frank uh, responded by hitting 44 home runs that year. So he went on a bit of a tear. And then Hodges went on to manage the um, Mets. And this gentleman came in to... Uh, to manage him, the Ted Williams, the Hall of Famer, right? And Ted Williams, the first thing he asked um, Frank Howard is, tell me how a guy who hit 44 homers could only walk 48 times. And what he convinced Howard to do was start taking some pitches and um, work work uh, pitchers deeper into the count and wait for his pitch. And Howard uh, fig figured it out, and he just exploded from there the next couple of years. So that's Ted Williams, in my opinion, when, before, when he first met uh, Frank Howard. And then after Frank listened uh, to his advice, here's, here's the grin on his face. So Ted Williams played a huge role in uh, Frank Howard's career. And then from um, starting in his 30-year-old season in 1967, you know, Frank Howard had... 36, 44, 48, and 44 home runs. From 67 to 71, he hit 278 with 198 home runs. He led the major leagues in home runs. And he started just um, annually showing up in the uh, league leaders, like in this one in the 1968 where he hit 39 home runs and finished third in the league. Or here in uh, 1969, he hit 48 home runs and finished second to Harmon Killebrew. Or 1970, where he hit, um, where he led the league in RBIs. You know, Frank, Rob, or Frank Howard, I always say Robinson, Frank Howard, um, he led the league in home runs two out of three years, and he would have won them three years in a row. In 69, he finished one home run behind. Um, Killebrew. And what happened there is they were tied with 48 home runs going into the last couple games of the season. Killebrew, uh, early in the day, hit his 49th, um, and he had two games to play. Frank only had one. And that uh, later game, 
Ted Williams uh, put Frank in the leadoff spot so he'd get more chances to hit the home runs, but um, he didn't, and neither did Killebrew. Um, and he finished one home run short. He finished one home run short of leading the majors three years in a row. But not only did he just hit home runs, he hit some of the longer home runs. Um, some people, One story was he hit a line drive off of uh, Whitey Ford that Tony Kubek jumped to get. And it went, went over his head and all the way to uh, the, the wall that... Um, that was then fielded, and it was so hard off the wall that Frank Robinson was held to a single. So he just hit the ball with amazing power. In RFK, there are 30 seats in the upper deck that have uh, been painted, that were painted white because he put so many balls up there. He, um, you know, they didn't really record it, but um, a lot of people felt that he hit more than one home run that would have traveled 600 feet. You know, in the end, he had a really good career. When he retired, he had 382 home runs, um, which at the time was the eighth most by a right-handed hitter. He had 1,119 RBIs and a 273 batting average. So he wasn't just, he didn't just hit 100% for power. Uh, I will tell you, his 382 home runs today still have him tied for 69th with Jim Rice and Ryan Howard. He actually has more home runs than uh, Tony Perez or Orlando Cepeda, both Hall of Famers. So big power hitter. When I was growing up in the 60s, this guy was the most feared hitter. Um, you know, he went on after his playing career to coach and manage. He actually managed uh, one year for the San Diego Padres. Uh, they were a really bad team. He was let go after one year. And then as a coach for the Mets, he, he became, I believe, the interim manager for the Mets. He was also let go after one year, but he spent a lot more years in baseball um, coaching. But he's remembered just for being the most feared hitter of his decade and really the, the biggest guy to ever play. And to think that, you know, if you know how big Aaron Judge is, to think about this guy 60 years ago is... Um, it, it, he was just an imposing figure, and I think he's one that people should know about. Um, the other thing, and I will tell you um, two things, is one, if you see him over here, he's wearing glasses. His first four years in baseball, he didn't, he, his eyesight was so bad, his good eyesight was 2040, and his bad was 2060. Uh, so think about that. He's trying to hit 90 mile an hour fa fastballs and he can't see that well. He also put up these numbers in the, mostly in the 60s and early 70s. And the 60s were a pitcher's time. Um, that, uh, those, that era was really a pitcher's era. And so what he did with his batting average and his home runs was, uh, was pretty impressive. So there you have it. Frank Howard, um, great guy to, to, uh, to, to learn about, uh, maybe the most powerful hitter that ever played the game. Uh, let me know. I uh, hope you like this. Let me know what you think. We'll talk to you soon. Stay safe. Keep collecting.